Because God is holy in love that he can be trusted. That God works to heal, to save, and restore. In Psalm 34, David, having experienced God's goodness in his life, invites us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanksgiving is a time in which we, we taste things that are related to, to, to Thanksgiving, which is, for most of us, it's turkey and cranberry sauce and dressing and whatever else. And, and for those of us who love that, it is like you, you just look forward to it and you salivate and you want to sink your mouth into it. And this is a very vivid picture of the invitation that we get to sink our teeth into who God is. To live our lives to feed on the one who is good. In other words, to bite in, to get your refreshment, your nourishment, your pleasure, your experience by trusting God with your life and then experience with, experiencing with your senses, with your very eyes, that he is good. So many times I, I demonstrate my disbelief in God and his goodness by how I think how I speak and how I act. So I invite you to pray this with me right now. Oh, Father, you are good. You don't have to pray it out loud. I'll just read it. But yeah, uh, just in your mind, pray this. Oh, Father, you are good. May each of us make that choice to step up and to take the fruit of your goodness and to sink our teeth into it. For so long we have eaten the junk food of grumbling, of whining, of criticizing, and all we have to show for it is sick stomachs, heartburn, broken, strain, restrain, strained relationships. For so long, Father, we have chosen to, to see what is wrong with this world, what is wrong with each other, what is wrong with ourselves, that we have been, become blind to seeing your beauty, your goodness, especially as it is expressed in this world, especially as it's expressed in each other, and especially as it is shown in ourselves. Spirit of God, we confess our sin. We want to taste and see that you are good. Open our eyes, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you email us that prayer? Sure. I, you will send, yes, I will. Yeah, okay, fine, yeah. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Choosing to live from this reality will certainly lead one to breathing thankfulness. But Scripture teaches a different way, a second way, I should say, not a different way, a second way to breathe a be thankful life. And that is to thank God for what he has done. And for this, we're going to turn to Psalm 107. Um, and we're doing, going to read it through. We're not stopping here long. We're just, I'm wanting to read through because the psalm covers some points, some practical points as to why are we encounter what God has done. The psalm begins by saying, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. It then begins by saying this. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell your story. So if, if you are redeemed, which means if you are a believer, if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, if you are redeemed then you are invited to tell your story. The redeemed are those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from the east and the west, and the north and the south. Again, that worldwide understanding of God's work, that he loves the whole world. 
He then goes on to tell the experiences of four groups of people. The first group were people without a home. They were hungry. They were thirsty. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Some wandered in desert wastelands. They found no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry. They were thirsty. Their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, his wonderful deeds for humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and he fills the hungry with good things. Now, for those reading this, they would have immediately thought back to the children of Israel in the desert that God brought them out and they were hungry and they were thirsty and they did cry out. They didn't cry to the Lord, though. They demanded and they cried to Moses, and they, but they, God heard them. And I think at this point in time, he then expands it to people of anyone who, who experiences the physical realities of not having enough. Think of your own life. How is God good here? That he has provided for us all along the way. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually... Uh, yeah, God is just so good. I'm saving my sharing for later, so let's leave it at that. Um, but then we go on to verse 4 and following. Sorry, not that one. Verse 10 and following. Um, he says, Some sat in darkness and utter darkness. They were prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and he broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds for humankind, for he breaks down the gates of bronze, and he cuts through bars of iron. Question for you. Why or how is God good in this little sonnet? Anyone? How is God good here? Saul says he brings us through the desert so we can be in the sunshine again. He gets us out of uh, prison, out of darkness, and probably sin is, are the chains, you know. Yeah. Chains. So brings us out of darkness, uh, sin, out of, uh, sin is the chains, yes. I, I think of, um, again, I think this probably had the people thinking back to their, their slavery in Egypt, right? where they had bitter labor and, and there was no one to help them um, and, and they cried to the Lord and he saved them. But the other thing, of course, is that to go back to your sin analogy is you think of Isaiah 61, the very first um, text that Jesus quotes when he begins his ministry. And what does he say? He says... The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. And then he gets up and he says, and he says a few other things, but he says, then he says, today this scripture is fulfilled. How is God good? Because he saves. And we're going to be coming back to that a bit later. Again, we're just cruising through this. Um, now here's an interesting one. He then turns to fools. <laughs> Some became fools. And why are they fools? 
because of their rebellious ways. Oh, oh, I guess that makes me a fool. Us a fool. Because we turn away from God and think that we can do better than the one who created us, the one who loves us, the one who calls us his own. So some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and they drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and he healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, his wonderful deeds for humankind. Let them sacrifice thanks offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Mercy. How is God good? Because he's merciful. Because even though we turn away, he still acts to save us, to heal us. And then this is an interesting one, because of course, uh, this isn't really applicable to us, but this one speaks to God's involvement in our everyday lives, in whatever vocation we maybe find ourselves in. Some went out to the, on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the muddy waters, and they saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and he stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the war storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love for his wonderful deeds for humankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Now, what story comes to mind here when you read this? Anyone? Sorry? Job? Job? Why Job, Lita? Okay, okay, so Lita says, Job, because he didn't let what he was going through take him away from God. Good. But this is about people in a storm. What story? The disciples, right? They're, they're going across Galilee, and the storm comes up. You can almost, this is almost quoted from, could, Jesus could have quoted this, right? He stilled the storm to a whisper. And the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. The one who created heaven and earth is the one who continues to work in this world to care for us, to rescue us. Think of the times in which you have been, have been brought out of situations in your life that have seemed perilous, that you are, there's no hope, that it's, it's, it's going the wrong direction. And then things change. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The next one. He turned rivers into a desert. He flow, flowing springs into thirsty ground, fruitful land into a salt waste. Why? Because of the wickedness of those who live there. Now, what kind of a good God does that? A just God. A just God, exactly. And a just God who is saying, 
like in, in the covenant with God, and we've talked about this, in his name we've talked about this, there is that he is merciful, that he is compassionate, that he is, he is holy, but at the same time it's that he will, he will um, bring justice to the situation. In the covenant he says, listen, I, I want to bless you, I'm going to bless you, but if you turn away from me, know this, that the result is that I'm going to use calamity to seek to bring you, to wake you up, to seek to bring you back to me. Yeah, pretty basic parenting, isn't it? Um, sorry? With the point of restoration. With the point of restoration, yes. So he turns, he's willing to do this. He cares so much that he's going to act to help us wake up. Now, of course, the challenge here is that this is, we immediately think of if something's going wrong in my life, then I must have done something wrong. Well, it may be, but that's a process of discernment and, and searching our hearts. Now listen what the next list of this is. He says, He turned the desert into pools of water, and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields, and they planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds di diminish. God is good, because this is his heart's desire, is to bless us. Justice. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled, humbled, I should say, humbled. There's a new word. They were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempts on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste, but he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice. But all the wicked shut their mouths. Let the one who is wise heed these things and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord. Again, in, this, in these two pages here, we see this ebb and flow of, of people who turn against God and, and God turning, trying to bring them back to him and then they're blessing them and then they turn against God and, and the message on the second page is, but God, in the midst of all of that good and evil that we have in this world in such stark ways right now, there he lifts up the needy. He cares for the needy. He increases them, their families like flocks. God cares about us. Let the one who is wise heed these things and ponder the loving deeds of the Lord that God is active in my life, in your life, in our life. The question is, will we trust him? The question is, will we see and watch for those things where he is active and in those things where we can't see that trust that he is working So here's the pattern. We find ourselves in trouble. It could be due to circumstances in our life, um, without a home and a sea storm, or it could be due to our sin, or it could just be due to, to the pressures around us. Our situation seems hopeless. There seems to be no way forward. It's just discouragement after discouragement after discouragement. We then call out to God. God help us. And we do it. It's, it becomes our cry. Oh God help us. Help me. And God saves us. And in response, we are to give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for humankind. Is this not your story? This is a story I'm going to be inviting us to share later on. 
how has God done this in your life? The psalmist begins with telling us our story and ends the invitation with a wise person is one who follows God, who looks, reflects, and declares him that he is good and declares what he has done. So thank God for who he is, is how I can be thankful all the time. Number two, thank God for what he has done. And by the way, in case I forget to say this later on, just remember, Thanksgiving doesn't, has nothing to do with feelings, right? They can be, right? Someone does something nice to you and you immediately well up, hopefully, unless you think that, that you deserve it and whatever else. But if, if you are... Uh, Normally, you would, but it, it, Thanksgiving has nothing to do with feelings. It has to do with a decision, a choice. Will you thank God for who he is when it doesn't sound like who he is is what's going on around you? Will you thank God for what he has done when it doesn't seem like he's doing what he should be doing? which just gets us back to a foundation, the foundation for thanking God, the one that allows us to understand who he is and to give thanks for what he's done, and that is Jesus Christ. We know the story. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, at just the right time, Paul writes in Romans 5, while we were still powerless, useless, without the ability to save ourselves, while we wanted nothing to do with God, while we were in that state, Christ died for the ungodly, died for you, died for me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then this final quote from Paul. Here's a trustworthy saying, everyone. a saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Can I see where that is? 1 Timothy 1. 1 of whom I am the worst, he says. So how do we keep it front and center? How do I keep the fact that uh, I I should be full of thanks because of what Jesus has done. And the key phrase is found in that phrase, and you can't see it there, um, of whom I am the worst. Now, Luke speaks of an encounter Jesus had with two people, a Pharisee and a sinful woman, in quotation marks. The Pharisee invited Jesus to come and eat at his house. Jesus agreed and is soon reclining at the Pharisee's table. The woman, hearing that Jesus is there, gets a jar of perfume and risking much humiliation. Remember, people knew who she was. Goes to this house where she then breaks down and weeps at Jesus' feet. Using her tears as water, and her hair as a towel, she cleans Jesus' feet, she kisses them, 
and then pours perfume on them. How I wish we could fully understand this act. How I wish we could fully understand the cultural implications of this. The audacity she did had to do this. It was a very public act. It was a very humbling act. To break down in tears was one thing. To allow her hair to have enough tears to break down that she could actually wash the feet spoke of great, great emotion. To allow her hair, that which represented her glory and her beauty in that culture, to become filthy and dirty from Jesus' stinky feet, from his dirty feet, was even more humbling. Then to kiss his feet and to waste a lot of money pouring perfume on his feet. This was unbelievable and it did not go unnoticed. Unfortunately, the Pharisee, the person who carefully obeyed God's commands and law, plus many others, the person who was good, the person who was Mark Daniluk, could only criticize the woman and Jesus. He thinks to himself, if this man was a prophet, he would know who is touching him, what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. And so Jesus tells him a simple story and then asks a simple question. And yes, you can turn Luke 7. If I'd only done that, you wouldn't have stressed out the last minute. <laughs> Luke chapter 7, at the beginning. I mean, verse 41 is where we're going to enter the story. <clears throat> Simon, Jesus said to him, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, which is about 500 days of wages, and the other owed him 50, which is 50 days of wages. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, here's the simple question. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. The barrel man had a huge debt. The rich man just had a big, bit of a debt. Which will love him more? He who has been forgiven little, loves little. That's why I really have such a hard time with people who say, well, I'm actually pretty good. I don't, and, and what they're really saying is, I don't need that much forgiving. <laughs> right? That's, the op that's, that's what's being implied. I'm not that much of a sinner. Now, I dare say that most, if not all of us, if we're honest with ourselves here, fall into the Pharisee camp. We are pretty good people. Oh, sure, we judge. Sure, we're quick to point out the sinners in our midst. Sure, we treat people based on what we think of them. But we're still good or right. And they're bad and they're wrong. Sure, we don't love unconditionally with an agape love, with a, a, a decisional love that says, I'm going to love regardless. But 
The fact is, the debt we owe is still greater, in fact, is still far greater than we can pay. Oh, I wish the person each and every one of us would identify with in the story would be the one who was forgiven much. <laughs> the woman who was willing to completely humble herself at great cost to herself. I was wishing Charlie would be here this morning, but I know she won't have a problem with this because I'm just going to speak her story, right? What does Charlie do when she comes here every Sunday? When she comes here? Cry. She cries. Why does she cry, Saul? Yes, she cries because she weeps because she is forgiven and she cannot believe it. How sad that for most of us, we've lost touch with that beauty. And that doesn't mean that in order to be authentically forgiven and to be like Charlie is, we all have to weep and cry every Sunday. That's Charlie, okay? <laughs> That's dear Charlie. But having said that, What a beautiful expression. Having said that, there are other ways we can communicate the beauty of what God has forgiven in our lives. The woman was willing to completely humble herself at great cost to herself. This woman had a glimpse, a taste of who God is, that he is good, that he is holy, and in him there is no sin or darkness. That Jesus was worthy and therefore her sinfulness was made all the more real to her. Thus she used her tears to wash Jesus' feet. She, her hair to dry them, perfume to anoint them. It was a radical act. And it makes you wonder, where did Jesus, this woman encounter Jesus before this event? Something happened where I believe this woman encountered Jesus from a distance or not. Maybe it was that one look, but maybe it was an interaction. Whatever it was, this woman knew enough what it was to be rejected by holy people, to be judged by holy people. And here was this holy person who looked at her or spoke to her, who acted to her in a way that says, I love you, and looked beyond the sin to the person behind that. And in that moment, she felt a sense of hope. A sense of, oh, my life doesn't need to be defined by what I've done. It can be defined by the one who sees me, who loves me. In Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah, who was a good man, gets a glimpse of God. He sees his glory and his perfect goodness, and his holiness fall, and, and his holiness. And, and Isaiah, when he encounters God, he falls on his face, knowing that he is unworthy and sinful. And upon receiving God's mercy, he freely declares, Here am I, I send me. I will do whatever you ask. His meeting with God caused him to be willing to do anything God wanted him to. And like Isaiah, the sinful woman knows that Jesus is worthy, and she was willing to do a radical act of worship because she knew that Jesus loved and accepted her and forgave her. The woman who took the risk and tasted and experienced that God is good, that God saves through Jesus Christ. And she actively responded to it. The, the sinful woman didn't just sincerely thank Jesus, but she acted in extreme wild ways to show her thankfulness. 
Isaiah's response to God's holiness and being forgiven was to say, whatever you want, I will do it. Here am I, send me. And what that means for you and for me, well, that is something that we each need to figure out. But I do know that the one definite active response all of us can do is to exercise our spiritual muscles and play no practice of breathing out the complaints, breathing out the criticisms, and purposely choosing to breathe in thankful words and thoughts to God first. But, and this brings me to my last point, to each other. To thank God for each other. Do you know that in the New, New Testament, the two most frequent uses for thanksgiving are for giving thanks? The first one is for giving thanks for, before a meal, by the way. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? But the second one is for giving thanks to one another. The most frequent command to get in giving thanks is that we give thanks for one another. This is so important because it ties closely with remaining thankful for Jesus. We all come together on the basis of one and one thing only. Actually, it's not one thing, it's one person and one person only. Our sin is the great leveler of us all. We are all sinners, and Jesus is the greatest raiser of us all to life. In this time in which there is such division and, and, and hard opinions, etc., etc., especially within the Christian community, but it just is mirrored every which way. I am more and more convinced that as believers, we need to come under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. That it is only Jesus. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith being reported all over the world. I thank my God for you because of your, his grace given you in Jesus Christ. For this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. How can I be thankful? All the time. By making the decision regardless of what circumstances are going around me, regardless of how I may feel in the moment, to thank God for who he is, to thank God for what he's done, to thank God for Jesus, and to thank God for each other. As we head into worship, and Rick, if you can come up, we're going to be giving you the opportunity to respond, to practice being thankful but only as a way to equip and encourage you to do it in your moment-by-moment -moment life. In this world that is inundated by all that is wrong, may we be a people who declare what is good and right. God and his saving hand in our lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for the cross. But that cross is there because of who you are, because of your Father, because of the Spirit, because of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who, that you are good, that you are compassionate, that you are merciful, that you care about us, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of us. And that even though we turned away from you, you have been acting to bring us back to yourself. 
So we thank you for who you are, for what you have done. Thank you for Jesus. And as part of living out your heart's desire that we be thankful also for each other. As Paul says in Timothy 4.2, be, be thankful, be watching, pray. May we watch and give thanks in this world that wants to say that everything is wrong, that you don't exist, it doesn't really matter. We're just on our own. Thank you that we can worship you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, on to the next one here.